Hello everybody, it's Dr. Galvin with a Friday update. Um, as usual, we try a couple times a week to do an update. For those of, us, of you new to us, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a physician, board certified in emergency medicine, and also run a functional medicine clinic here in Charlotte. So I take care of patients in the emergency department and also clinic patients here. As usual, we start with the numbers worldwide, 21 million cases, 760,000 deaths. In the US, 5.4 million cases, 170,000 deaths. Here in my state of North Carolina, 142,000 cases, 2,313 deaths. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about positivity rates and things like that, and, and positivity rates are going down in North Carolina. And that's a pretty good indicator of what the virus is doing in the community. And that positivity rate basically means if, if we do 100 cases, you know, what percent of those cases are coming back positive? And, you know, a month ago in North Carolina, that number was around 10 percent. And it's now dropped to between 5 and 6 percent. We figured that if it goes below 5 percent, you, you think that the virus is getting under control. I believe in New York State now it's less than 1%, and that, that seems to be fully under control, but it's important to, to watch those numbers, and it does look like adding masks and things like that have had a significant impact on the number of positive cases. So that's good news. Um, what you may notice, and you know, this is the news cycle, right? They, they wanna be sensational, and so you're hearing lots of, of information that we're, we're setting record numbers of deaths. Well, does that mean that the virus is getting worse? Well, actually, if you look at the overall numbers, overall case numbers are actually starting to go down. So why would we have increasing deaths if our case numbers are going down? Well, it has to do with the, the sort of pathophysiology of the disease. When people die of COVID-19, they don't die instantly. It's not like they catch it and then drop dead. So there's a progression. Typically people get exposed, they're asymptomatic for a period of time, they develop symptoms, and a subset of those people are going to get pretty sick and they end up maybe in the hospital. They get admitted to the hospital and actually a lot of them are kind of sick for a couple of days and then they look like they get better and then all of a sudden they get much worse. And they sort of precipitously decline and ultimately end up in the ICU and some of those people end up on a ventilator. And a percentage of those end up dying. But when did the deaths occur? The, the deaths occur far later. So they lag far behind when they were admitted to the hospital. Many, you know, there's many cases of people lingering on a ventilator, you know, three, four, six weeks before they actually succumb to the virus. So those death numbers that we're seeing are really people that probably were admitted to the hospital, you know, a month to two months ago. Um, or developed symptoms rather, were exposed you know, months ago. And so we're gonna probably see those death numbers continue to increase and hopefully at the same time see you know, case positivity rates and, and overall positive numbers decrease as we implement more of the social distancing and masking and things like that that we've been talking about sort of ad nauseum. Um, but don't be surprised if you see those death numbers going up. It, it's, remember, it's, it, there's a big, pretty significant lag. Just like there's a lag between sort of positive, you know, diagnosed cases and hospitalizations because people get exposed, they're asymptomatic, then they get sick and then they progress and then they ultimately get admitted to the hospital if they're going to, sort of far, you know, far removed from when they first got infected. Um, there's, you know, the CDC and a couple other people have talked about, you know, about this looming pot potential public health crisis coming in the fall. And I think I've been asked this question a few times, what does that all mean? Well, basically it means this, you got this virus, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 that's rampant in our, our population right now in the US. Right now, hospitals are, are, are pretty full, we're busy, we're seeing lots and lots of cases. The problem is that this is not the time of year we should be busy. We should be actually, in terms of acute illnesses, the summertime is, is, a, is a time of year that hospitals are generally not full. Come fall though, when flu season hits, that's when volumes go up and hospitals fill up. So if you take sort of the, the ongoing crisis with COVID and you add on to it the flu and all the other winter illnesses, you can see where we can kind of have a, a, a mashup of, of com, sort of competing illnesses that can be very significant and it can significantly impact the healthcare system and patients as well. Now, 
you know, it, one of the worst flu years we ever had was I think 2017 and 18, H1N1, and I think 70 to 80,000 people died of the flu that year. I think this past year, the numbers were more like 40,000. Now, the good news is that the same things that sort of prevent us from ca catching COVID are also going to prevent us from catching the flu. So that's why flu numbers were pretty low this year, because, you know, if you social distance and, and you, um, you're washing your hands and everything else, not only are you not going to give people COVID, you're not going to give them the flu, you're not going to give them colds or any other of these sort of infectious respiratory diseases. The flu vaccine, you know, is important. We, we've you know, about 50% of the country gets the flu vaccine. It's actually pretty effective. And if we can cut down on the number of people that get the flu that potentially can get really sick and die, we can probably have a pretty big impact. So if we want to prevent this potential problem in the fall and winter, we've really got to follow the guidelines of, of separation and hand washing and, and avoiding crowds and wearing your mask. And also, you know, getting a flu shot is a really good uh, idea. The flu shot is, is, is been used for a long, long time. It's safe. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's relatively effective. There are some years that it's better than others. Remember, the flu shot kind of uses the, the, va the flu version from the previous year because it mutates a little bit. And generally, if you're immune to the, the prior flu, then the new strain you're usually immune to, too. Um, another interesting thing that came out, I think, today from the CDC was they actually gave some guidance about um, immunity. And we, you know, we, immunity has been a big question. There's been a number of studies that show that when people develop COVID-19, many of them develop antibodies, but also some studies have shown that that antibody protection may not last. There's been a few studies that shown after about three months, some percentage of people lose the antibodies. Now we don't know if that may mean that you still have T cell immunity and, and we don't really know. And, I mean, just as a rule of thumb, like I'm not the world's brightest person, but like I, I look at 21 million cases worldwide and we have not seen, you know, a huge amount of cases reported of people getting COVID more than once. And out of 21 million worldwide in, in 5.3, 5.4 million people in the U.S., if that was happening with a great frequency, you'd think that we would hear about it. And I have not really seen any studies, but again, we don't have any hard proof, but the CDC has finally said that they generally consider people protected for at least three months after you've had COVID. So if you've had a diagnosis of COVID for about three months, you know, you, you probably don't need to isolate if you get exposed to somebody else. There's presumptive immunity for at least that long. And hopefully as we get more information, more of that will, you know, we'll know more. Uh, a couple other things. You know, we've talked about monoclonal antibodies and, and that, that may be a really excellent treatment for the virus because they're synthetically created antibodies against either pieces of the virus or the virus itself. And it, it, it sort of uses the same um, idea of convalescent plasma. We have these antibodies. If we inject them into somebody, they, they may be helpful. The problem is that the studies that are following, that are looking at these treatments are getting delayed. And, and in part because of staffing issues, um, space issues, um, and sort of reluctance of people to sign up for these studies because, you know, people are, are somewhat, you know, it, it's a, a study that you got to sign up for and you may get a placebo. So some people don't want to do that if they're going to get treated. The other thing, there's a little bit of a time window. So most of the, re it requires treatment to start within seven days of symptom onset and generally within three days of a positive test, but the testing delays. So people get symptoms, they're not really sure if they get it. Maybe three days later, they get tested. Well, if the test takes four days to come back, then you missed your window. So they're struggling. And there were a number of companies that were saying they would have, you know, maybe workable treatments in September um, or maybe October. And now a number of those companies are now saying, you know, end of the year, first quarter next year. So I think there's been some delays in that. And that's unfortunate. I'm going to end things there. Um, I hope everybody has a really wonderful weekend. The one last thing I did want to bring up is I did post something on our Facebook today page today about this sort of blossoming problem of depression, anxiety, and um, suicides, real, you know, largely related to the virus probably and all the changes and everything else. So, you know, what can we do? Well, we can keep our eyes open, you know. Sometimes it's just someone noticing is enough to make, you know, to really make a difference in somebody's life. So if you notice friends of yours or family members that are maybe acting 
a little bit unusual, you know, talk to them, find out what's going on. And if they, and if they, you think that they're suffering from depression, try to let's help them get some, try to get them some help. I know it's not easy, but we've got to keep our eyes open and we've got to look out for each other. As usual, wash your hands, wear your mask, take care of yourselves, take care of your families, take care of those around you. I'll be back. Oh, and there is a hormone lecture coming up. We had some technical difficulties, so we have to refilm it, but I will be posting it probably early next week, and my apologies. Have a great weekend. Stay safe.